So some of you know, I tried to be funny so I didn't get emotional when I talk about our daughter's wedding. We got a picture, so I'll just show a picture. So as many of you know, our daughter Morgan got married a couple weeks ago. We welcomed Andrew into our family. We got a picture of our family here. And I know that the biggest fear for many of you was, Paul, how in the world are you going to make it through the day? (laughs) And so um, I'm going to hold off on the last picture for just a moment. So the way I made it through the day was this. Um, I just kind of wept throughout the whole day. So I was out greeting. You know, brides like hide on their wedding day, and the father of the bride just walks around. And I don't know how many of you have experienced this. But I just kind of had this constant tears like flowing down my eyes as I was talking to people. And Morgan came out of the bridal room um, in order for us to get ready to walk down the aisle. And and literally, like I see her, and I'd seen her in her, you know, wedding dress, so it wasn't that. But I had so much congestion in my head (laughs) that I literally just blew my nose right before we had to like walk down the center aisle. And I don't know if any of the rest of you all done that. So the last picture I have is us actually making our way down. Now, the best thing that happened, well, there were a lot of great things. One of the humorous things that happened was literally as Morgan and I are about a third of the way down this aisle, her veil that you see is in the back of her head completely falls off. (laughs) And she's like, Dad, I just lost my veil. And now fortunately, Pastor Scott was sitting about two-thirds of the way back, And it landed right in front of him, and he picked it up. Now, Pastor Scott's a smart man. He handed it to the woman in front of him and said, (laughs) here. (laughs) And and Morgan and I, neither one of us remember this moment. Like, we remember the veil falling off. And my daughter, like a third of the way down, Bill's playing, you know, but Bill's playing. And she says to this woman, who is actually one of her advisors in her youth ministry in Solana Beach, she says to her, just shove it in. And it was like, this picture is taken right after that happened, actually. But it was just one of those moments where all of a sudden, like, the tears and the, like, all the stuff that comes to those weddings, it was just gone because it was just this hilarious moment because she's like, I'm getting married. Like, I don't care. That thing has to be, you know, because all this care and attention. And she's like, let's go. So there's a couple of pictures of us from the wedding. Now, a part of the wedding ceremony, she asked me to do the meditation as well. So not only did I have to walk her down the aisle without completely collapsing, I then had to get up here in front of her and her friends and do the wedding message. And I chose to do some of the Psalms from the Psalms of Ascent, which is one of the Psalms we're going to look at this morning. And to talk about the importance of the Psalms of Ascent as we live out our lives, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. Now, I have to tell you, preaching the meditation at your daughter's wedding is a little bit intimidating. But the other intimidating thing was this. As I looked out in the congregation, I counted at least 10 Presbyterian pastors (laughs) and Episcopalian priest, who's my brother, and I thought, I better make sure I get the exegesis right on this wedding message, right? Actually, I didn't think that. But it was a little intimidating, right? Like having your daughter look at you and then having all these pastors But I chose the Psalms of Ascent because Psalm 120 to Psalm 134 are about a journey. They're the songs that Israel would sing as they made their way to Jerusalem three times a year. Exodus chapter 23, verse 14 says this. God says to Moses to say to Israel, three times a year you are to celebrate a festival to me. Passover, Pentecost, and the festival of booths or tabernacles. So three times a year, the people of Israel would make their way from wherever they were to Jerusalem to go and worship the living God. And over time, there were songs that were developed for the people of Israel to sing. So when you look in your Bible and you look at Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, you'll notice the the ascription that is given to them is a song of ascent or a psalm of ascent. 
Years ago, I read a book by Eugene Peterson who did a brief commentary on these songs, these psalms. They said, we need to make a decision in our lives as we follow our Lord, whether we are going to be tourists or pilgrims. He said, a lot of people of faith treat their faith as though they are tourists. They show up, they get an experience, and they walk away. And they probably don't remember much. They said the job and the task given to us as followers of Jesus is not to live as tourists, but to live as pilgrims. Because when you are a pilgrim, you are on a journey. But you also know where your destination is. And so for the people of Israel, their destination three times a year was to go to Jerusalem to meet with God. To make that journey. And so these songs were written that Israel might sing them as they made their journey up the 2,500 feet or so of elevation into the city of Jerusalem to the temple. Now, as I look at the Psalms of Ascent, if you spent much time in the Psalms of Ascent, I'm always fascinated by how they start. Obviously, it starts with Psalm 120, but I'm fascinated by the words that are used. Because when I think about when I am heading into worship, when I am going to meet with God, when I am coming into this sanctuary, when I am helping to pick hymns for the opening hymn of saying, we are here to meet with God. We have a prayer of adoration. We have a call to worship. We have a choir that sings an intro that says, come let us meet with God. We expect it to be upbeat. You do not expect a dirge as your opening hymn on a Sunday morning. Perhaps on Monday, Thursday, yes but not on Sunday morning. But listen to how Psalm 120, the very first Psalm of Ascent, begins. Reading verses one and two. I call on the Lord in my distress. And he answers me. Save me, Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. And listen to how it ends. Verses six and seven. Too how long have I lived among those who hate peace? I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. How about that opening hymn that begins with distress and ends with war? But the psalmist knows something. And the psalms of ascent know something. And they know that life is not always easy. Some of us here this morning are feeling much more distress than we are feeling joy. Some of us here this morning are in the midst of wars, maybe not physical wars, but a war of the will or a war within the family and the brokenness that exists. And so the Psalms of Ascent recognize something that is very important, and that is this, that life is not always easy. You may recall that one of the paths up to Jerusalem was through Jericho. And Jesus told a parable about that. Remember the called the Good Samaritan. And the dangerous journey that it was to go to Jerusalem and back because the roads were filled with robbers and thieves and it was not always safe and easy. And that is the truth of our lives. So the Psalms of Ascent begin there, but then we get to Psalm 121, which is the way in which I begin our daughter's wedding, because it is a psalm of saying, let us lift our eyes up to the living God, because it is this God who is with us, and particularly it is this God who sees us. So if you were here last Sunday, you'll know that I started a new sermon series called Open Our Eyes. And the opening text that I use was from Hebrews about talking about the God who is invisible, who creates visible things. And then we went on to talk about Psalm Psalm 19 that says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And I asked you this week to open your eyes, to see the wonder of God, to, as Tim Keller wrote so great, he says, to see the heavens as God's cosmic Welcome, Matt. 
then we look up to the heavens, we think, God created this. And then he put us in the midst of that and said, welcome home. The heavens declare the glory of God. And last week, a number of you all participated in an art project. We're doing three of these during the month of July that the Art Guild is hosting. And you slathered acrylic paint on canvases. And beneath that acrylic paint, which you may or may not have known, were letters that became words that are now revealed. And so I want to encourage you, if you were a part of that, even if you weren't a part of that, head over to the art gallery this, a- this afternoon. Don't go this afternoon. It will be closed. Um, after church, grab a cup of coffee, a scone, and just walk in and see the two canvases that were created. We're going to have an evolving art show throughout the whole summer. Um, the Art Guild is basically creating three different events based on three of my sermons, and so we'll continue to grow. So I want to encourage you. We don't have a picture of it. We don't want to spoil it for you, okay? You need to go over and take a look at it, okay? But I said, let's open our eyes. So this morning, I want us to open our eyes to another reality, and that is this. The God of the heavens and earth sees you. So Psalm 121, we read this. I lift my eyes to the hills, to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God will not let your foot slip. And now listen for how often the word watches shows up. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord sees you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. I lift my eyes. Can you imagine this? The nation of Israel making their way for one of the festivals and singing. I lift my eyes to the mountains. They're they're looking up toward Jerusalem. And when they say that, and they say, I lift my eyes to the mountains, they're thinking of the temple. Because remember, this is before the arrival of Jesus. This is before the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. This is when the, the, the very glory of God resided in the temple at Jerusalem. And so as they're singing this, they're saying, I lift my eyes to the mountains. I lift my eyes to the temple. I lift my eyes to the very presence of God. And I ask, where does my help come from? And the response is, my help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. And then the psalmist goes on to say, do you know what God does? God not only sees you, but God keeps you from stumbling. When things get hot, God is the, your shade at your right hand. When you grow weary, God is with you. God watches over you. God sees you. And for me, this is such an important message for us to remember. That we can look to the heavens and we can see what God has done. But do we also remember the God who created the heavens and earth also sees us? It's a very powerful image that we must hold on to and we must remember. And when doing that, we continue to climb. We continue to make our way. We continue to pilgrimage. I love that image of saying, I don't want to be a tourist in my faith. I want to be a pilgrim. I want to be headed someplace. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, as Isaiah 
begins his prophetic word, he talks about the importance of going up to the place of God. We read this. It says, many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. For there God will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. This is such a great Jewish teaching, but it's also a great teaching for us. This is why it is so important for us to meet with God. Whether you gather in the sanctuary, whether you watch online, whether you go to church somewhere else, it is the importance of saying, I need to make time to meet with God. Because it is very easy to forget the God who created the heavens and earth is the God who also sees us, the God who watches over us, the God who promises to be with us no matter what it is that might come our way. And the end result of the Psalms of Ascent is they make it to Jerusalem to worship that God, the God who sees us. So I want to fast forward a very large fast forward from the Psalms of Ascent and the Psalm 121 of speaking about the God who sees us to the days of Jesus. Now, as you know, Jesus himself made his way to Jerusalem many times. He sang the very songs that are written in our scriptures. They talked and they sang. And in Luke chapter, chapter 18, verse 31, Jesus tells his disciples something that he's told them before, something that they never quite figured out, but he would tell them time and time and time again until finally it became clear. This is the 31st verse of Luke 18. It says, Jesus took the 12 aside, the 12 apostles, and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. There's a third time in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus tells the disciples this, hey, I'm going to die. Hey, I'm going to die. Hey, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die. And the disciples never quite sorted all that out. But Jesus, in this chapter of Luke, knows that this is his final journey. And so they're making their way. And they get to a city called Jericho. And you may recall there is a blind beggar sitting there. The other gospels tell us that this beggar's name was Bartimaeus. And as Jesus and his apostles are walking along, perhaps even singing the songs of ascent, Bartimaeus is like, hey, what the heck's going on? And the crowd says, Jesus is coming by. And this blind man who cannot see, we do not know how long, how long it is that he has been, since he has been able to see, cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And do you remember what the crowd says? Shut up. No. Literally doesn't say it in the Bible, but that's what they said. Don't interrupt Jesus, Bartimaeus. You can't even see him. And what does Jesus do? He stops. And he looks at Bartimaeus and he says, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus says, I want to see. Jesus says, be healed. Your faith has made you well. And what does Bartimaeus do? Remember what he does? He gets up and he joins in the procession. He starts singing the songs because Jesus is headed up to Jerusalem. He's making his way to be with God and Bartimaeus says, I want to be a part of that. The one who could not see can all of a sudden see, but even more importantly, Jesus sees him. 
He doesn't allow the crowd to get in the way. And he stops. He says, Bartimaeus, come join the family. I see you. I know you. I love you. Do you remember the story that comes right after that? And this is, this is a question that I'm going to answer very quickly so you don't have to feel like you have to answer it. It's a story of a guy named Zacchaeus. So you have blind Bartimaeus, who has been probably oppressed for most of his life, who cannot see, but who is seen by Jesus. And then right after that story, we move into Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus is not oppressed, but he has oppressed others. So listen to this familiar story. Jesus now enters Jericho, and he was passing through. He had no no plans to stop in Jericho. He was making his way to Jerusalem for the Passover meal, for his last Passover. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead. Now, the thinking is this. He runs ahead probably outside the outskirts of, of Jericho because He doesn't want anyone to know that he wants to see Jesus. And he's hoping the crowd has kind of died down by the time they make their way through Jericho. He climbed a sycamore tree that had big, low branches, lots of leaves to see Jesus since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Notice the language there, today. What was Jesus' original plan? To keep moving So Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter. Remember, murmuring and muttering is never a good thing. That's what the Israelites did to Moses his whole life. They either murmured or muttered about what he was doing. They said he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I want us to think about Zacchaeus for a moment. And I want to think about him from the perspective of being a tourist. Because remember I said the Psalms of Ascent, as Eugene Peterson would say, You can either live your life as a tourist in the faith or a pilgrim. I think, well, there probably are better illustrations, but I think Zacchaeus makes for a great tourist. He heads outside of town. He climbs a tree. Obviously because he's short, I guess. But why is he climbing a sycamore tree? He does not want to be seen. He simply wants to check out Jesus. He's a tourist. Let me pop in, take a little look, and then move on to the next thing. And what happens? Jesus, who has already stopped in the presence of a blind man sitting by the city gate and brought him healing, stops again. And remember, Bartimaeus is a part of the crowd, right? So the very first thing he sees is Jesus stopping once again and saying to Bartimaeus, I want to come hang out with you tonight. I see you. I've been watching for you. I've been waiting for you. And now I want to come hang out with you. What has Zacchaeus done to deserve that? The answer is nothing, in case you're with the guy. Sounds like nothing. Like, he's, he's actually just kind of hiding, trying to, but what does Jesus do? This is the way grace works, my friends. This is the way the gospel message works. Jesus stops and looks at us and says, today, I want to have dinner at your house. 
What he's saying is, I want to come into your life. Why does the crowd murmur and mutter? Not just because Jesus is going to the house of a sinner, but what does that say about Jesus going for the Passover meal? It makes him what? Unclean. Because people of great faith don't hang out with prostitutes and tax collectors because it makes you unclean. Now Jesus, the very son of God, the king of kings and lord of lords, is making himself unclean and the people are murmuring and muttering and Jesus doesn't care because you see, grace is costly. What God does for us in and through Jesus Christ not just costs Jesus that moment, but eventually it costs him his life. And then Zacchaeus, who is so overwhelmed by the reality that he has been seen and loved by Jesus, comes down and says, I'm giving it all away. He doesn't say that literally, but he's like, I don't care the cost. You see, grace is costly not only for Christ, but also for us. Because it calls us to abandon all those things that we hold on to so tightly. The things of this world that we think bring us satisfaction and will give us life and encouragement. But when we are seen and known by God, everything changes. So this morning, I want to remind us that God watches over you. God sees you. God loves you. Some of you have been hanging out in the sycamore fig tree. Kind of checking everything out from above. Not really sure you want to commit to all of this. And I want you to hear clearly today that Jesus stops in front of you and says, I want to be in your life. I want to come and have dinner with you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And there's nothing required of you. You see, this is the problem that so many people have with Christianity. They can't figure out what do I have to do to earn God's love because we live in a society where we have to do something to earn everything. And God simply comes along and says, hey, I see you, I love you, I want to come hang out with you. That's all. The response of Zacchaeus is the response of faith. But it is not what caused Jesus to go and hang out with him. Some of you are being tourists when God's calling you to be pilgrims. And God sees you. Some of you perhaps feel like the blind man at the gate. Wondering, does anybody see me? Does anybody notice me? The world keeps telling me to simply be quiet. Quiet. 